Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for the final session of our 2021 Healthcare Executive Webcast Series, Behavioral Health Transformation and Payment Reform. The presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And before we begin, I'm going to play a brief video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Okay, today's webcast is eligible for 1.5 CPE credits for the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. To qualify for these credits, you must attend for a minimum of 75 minutes and respond to at least five of the six polling questions. And now I'm going to turn it over to Brian Connor, the Hospital National Practice Leader for Moss Adams. Brian? All right, Amy, thank you so much. And uh, welcome back, everyone. And thank you for joining the third and final installment of our 2021 Healthcare Executive Webcast Series. As mentioned in our previous sessions, it's our 26th annual uh, or our 26th year hosting our annual conference. Uh, and this year, we are welcoming over 1,500 attendees. That number keeps going up each time. Uh, we have a session uh, from across the healthcare continuum. We've had excellent sessions so far with Fort Coles and the advisory board setting the stage with the healthcare industry state of the union. Uh, and Susan Denser, uh, Liz Fowler with CMMI, and Mark McClellan uh, going into a deep dive uh, on value based care and what the future of that structural shift might hold. And our webcast here today will be the perfect bookend uh, to our series. Uh, we'd like to thank you for joining us on this special day, a day where we officially honor and recognize uh, over 19 million uh, living veterans. Uh, so we'd like to take a few moments to reflect with gratitude on our nation's veterans. Uh, a few statistics, uh, Gulf, War, Gulf War era veterans now account for the largest uh, share of all U.S. veterans having surpassed Vietnam era veterans in 2016, according to the VA's 2018 population model estimates. According to the Pew Research Center, roughly three quarters, 78% of veterans in 2021 served during wartime and 22% during peacetime, a definition of which I'd love somebody to explain to me sometime. And then 20% of the vets uh, who served in either Iraq or Afghanistan suffer from either major depression or post-traumatic stress disorder. Almost 20% of the vets in these two categories have experienced a experienced a traumatic brain injury. This is according to the RAND Center for Military Health Policy Research. And about one in five veterans returning from Iraq and Afghanistan has post-traumatic stress disorder or depression, and more depression, excuse me, more shocking, an average of 20 veterans die by suicide every day, according to the National Alliance of Mental Health uh, in Illness. Highlighting these statistics on Veterans Day is important to recognize. Following the serious impact COVID has taken on our vets, our families, our children, our friends, and our employees, there's never been a better time to understand how behavioral health is being paid for in the U.S., and we look forward to exploring this in more detail uh, today. But before we get started uh, with our session, we wanted to uh, share a special announcement uh, related to our uh, health care conference. Because uh, Hope Springs Eternal, we are announcing we'll be hosting our 22 uh, 2022 Healthcare Executive Conference uh, in person, uh, back in person in November, on um, November 3rd and 4th of 2022. 
So please save the date and plan on joining us at the Red Rock Resort and Casino uh, in Las Vegas next year. If you would please take a moment to review your council, uh, you'll see you have a link to complete a brief questionnaire to make sure you're included in future announcements regarding next year's events. So please know that we welcome your participation and encourage you to submit questions throughout the session. We'll do our best to answer the questions after the discussion, time permitting, and your participation, as we've mentioned before, is critical to helping us deliver an engaging and thought-provoking virtual conference. And as with each of our webcasts, this one will be recorded and available for registrants on demand after the, uh, the event. So now let's get you warmed up uh, with the first our first two polling questions for those looking to secure those year-end CPE credits before we get to, into uh, introduction of today's panel. So our first question is, there's no wrong answer. What type of organization do you re uh, represent? A, behavioral health provider. We're cramming lots of things uh, into that. Community mental health centers, acute care, psychiatric hospitals, substance abuse counseling, residential outpatient adolescent treatment facilities, digital telehealth providers, et cetera. Uh, you're in that category B, physicians, C, hospital or health systems, payer or health plans, E, ancillary providers, F, long-term care providers, G, startup or investors, H, employer, non-healthcare related. I know we have a bunch of those in our sessions, uh, in our session here today, and then the ubiquitous other. So a reminder from previous sessions, just select the button next to the answer uh, that best fits your selection, and then you must hit submit. If you don't see the submit button on your screen, scroll down. Uh, it, we have a long list of uh, potential answers here, so it might be um, at the bottom of your screen. So we'll give our attendees just a few more minutes and take a look at the organization representation we have here today. As we've seen in our other two sessions, uh, we have a pretty good spectrum, kind of a concentration in hospitals and health systems, uh, but representation kind of across uh, the, uh, the healthcare continuing here, which I think is great uh, for our conversation today. So thank you for responding to that. Uh, let's go to our next polling question. And we'd like you to describe your knowledge of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act's requirements. A, none, B, a little, C, moderately knowledgeable, or D, very knowledgeable. And again, select the radio button next to your answer and hit submit. As a reminder, uh, we're gonna have six polling questions today. These are obviously the first two. Uh, in order to get CP credit, you need to complete 75% of the questions, so that's five. So those of you who are missing the first two questions, you're still going to have a, a access to an excellent session today. We'll wait just a few more moments here to get as many attendees participating as possible. And let's take a look at our knowledge of the mental health parity and addiction act those who have selected none or a little which is a significant percentage of our audience you are in luck today we're going to change that for you uh here in, in just a few moments so thank you for responding to those health care questions uh and now that we've gotten that or i'm sorry the uh, polling questions now that we've gotten that out of the way uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, our panelists for today's uh, session first of all we'd like to welcome back patrick j kennedy a former U.S. representative and founder of the Kennedy Forum. Patrick certainly needs no introduction, but we're going to give him one anyways. Uh, serving on behalf of Rhode Island's first congressional, congressional district, he spent 16 years in the U.S. House of Representatives, fighting to end its discrimination against those with mental illness, addiction, and other brain diseases. He's known as the lead sponsor of the landmark Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which you can find more, out, uh, more about coming up. Uh, which was passed with bipartisan support and signed into law by President George W. Bush on October 3rd, 2008. In 2013, he founded the Kennedy Forum, a not-for-profit organization whose mission is to lead a national dialogue on transforming mental health and addiction care delivery by uniting mental health advocates, business leaders, 
and government agencies around a common set of principles. Patrick, welcome. Great to have you here. I'm also pleased to welcome Sean Coughlin, President and CEO for the National Association for Behavioral Healthcare with over 30 years of advocacy experience. Sean is a leading healthcare policy expert who works with patient and provider groups, regulators, public and private payers, and trade associations. As CEO, he serves as the association's principal lobbyist, oversees the association's advocacy work on Capitol Hill, and helps to set and implement strategic policy goals that support high quality, evidence-based behavioral health care for Americans living with mental and substance abuse disorders. John, welcome. Thanks for having me, Brian. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Additionally, we welcome John Arch, a Nebraska state senator and behavioral health veteran. Uh, John represents District 14 in the Nebraska legislature and serves as chair of Health and Human Services Committee and as a member in the General Affairs and Urban Affairs Committees. But before beginning his first term in 2019, Senator Arch served in healthcare administration for over 30 years. For the last 25 years, he worked for Boys Town in its healthcare division. The last seven as executive vice president of healthcare and director of the National Research Hospitals and Clinics. Senator Arch, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation to be here. And finally, David Lloyd, uh, Senior Policy Advisor for the Kennedy Forum, who is serving as our moderator uh, for today's session. David focuses on a range of behavioral health policy issues, including implementation of the federal mental health parity and addiction, equi <laughs> addiction equity act. I will get that right at some point during this presentation <laughs> and state level parity laws. Previously, he was a vice president at Voices for Illinois Children and director of his Fis fiscal policy center which is part of the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities Partnership. David also served as, as a legislative assistant to U.S. Senator Debbie uh, Stabenow, covering a variety of issues, including housing, economic development, tax, and international trade. David, welcome. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I appreciate being uh, Yeah, to be. great to have you here. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to you uh, to uh, begin our uh, exciting discussion. Great. Well, uh, thank you for having us and uh, welcome to today's discussion. Uh, I'm David Lloyd, Senior Policy Advisor with the Kennedy Forum. Uh, and as Brian mentioned, I'll be moderating today's panel. Um, so we'll be focused on the foundational issue of financing mental health and addiction services uh, through health insurance coverage uh, with a particular focus uh, on mental health parity, uh, telehealth and payment reform. Uh, so you know, we'll, we'll jump right in. And you know, given that much of the panel will focus on mental health parity, we did think uh, that it would be helpful to provide an overview of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which we'll just refer to as the Federal Parity Act or Federal Parity Law, um, it, so that you know, give you a baseline of, uh, of knowledge to discuss uh, these issues. There are also some recent uh, policy uh, developments that uh, we'll discuss as part of the uh, part of the panel. Um, so thankfully, we have uh, the nation's leading champion for mental health parity joining us today um, as co-lead co-author of the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Uh, Congressman Patrick Kennedy, the founder of the Kennedy Forum, really played a vital role in its passage. Uh, and since leaving Congress, uh, has been a leading voice for the implementation and enforcement of the federal parity law. And ultimately, the federal parity law, you know, is all about uh, ensuring equal health insurance coverage uh, for mental health. Uh, and addiction uh, services. Um, and so Patrick and I will go over some of the basics, um, but I'll start out basically on you know, what uh, the Federal Parity Act is and what it applies to. So broadly, you know, the, the Federal Parity Act um, applies, uh, basically says that health insurance plans uh, have to equitably cover mental health and addiction services uh, if these services are covered benefits. Um, and generally, this applies to commercial uh, health insurance plans, both in the individual and small and large group market, as well as Medicaid managed care plans, uh, Medicaid alternative benefit plans, uh, and CHIP, Children's Health Insurance uh, Program, uh, as well. Um, it also applies to self-funded uh, non-federal government plans. So these are state and local plans, uh, unless they opt out. Um, so importantly, what it doesn't apply to is Medicare, uh, traditional Medicaid, uh, and TRICARE which is uh, particularly unfortunate, uh, you know, given uh, that today is uh, Veterans Day. So uh, also important in this discussion 
is the Affordable Care Act, um, which you know, came just after uh, the federal parity law. And because it requires most health plans um, to cover mental health and addiction services, um, the federal parity acts um, your protections are therefore uh, true uh, under under the federal uh, parity law. So, you know, what does the parity law actually require in a little bit more detail? Um, uh, Congressman Kennedy, do you want to discuss um, you know what the law's main provisions are, including the three uh, primary buckets? Um, under, yeah, uh, under the Federal Parity Act. Thank you so much, David. And again, appreciate the chance to be on with everybody uh, talking about this important issue. And it is uh, very significant given that it is Veterans Day and 22 veterans die each day of suicide. Um, and so many more, as was referenced, are suffering from the signature wounds of war, which is post-traumatic stress and traumatic brain injury. So um, over half of our veterans are, are guard and reservists, over our half of our fighting force, which means that all of you who are on this webinar who are employers, you have within your employment people who've served our country in uniform as guard and reservists, which means uh, they are going to get their health care uh, for their um, signature wounds of war through their commercial health insurance. Um, many of these veterans, even though they may have suffered from um, disability as a result of post-traumatic stress and TBI, many of them never screened for it when they got back stateside because there was an onerous burden on them to stay around for added evaluation. And these are for Guard and Reservists who had been away already on a tour of duty that had kept them away from their family and friends. So many of them were very reluctant to check, yes, if they had experienced uh, PTSD or TBI, which means that many of them are suffering today in silence. And the importance of us enforcing the parity law, which you'll hear today, is really for our for our veterans because they're going to need it, and um, as all Americans are going to need it. So basically, the law says you can't charge any higher copays, uh, deductibles, premiums. Uh, for mental health, uh, uh, because it's a, you have a mental health condition, or for mental health benefits, and there can't be any lower lifetime caps on coverage. Um, and, and it also uh, says, essentially, as David points out, that um, those are the quantitative treatment limits, that, that mental health and addiction services have to be on par with all other, uh, you know, covered con medical conditions. So at a primary care level, tertiary care level, um, it, you know, for, for primary, secondary, and tertiary levels of care, it has to be covered in the same way we, we would cover for diabetes prevention. We'd cover for, you know, higher acuity of diabetes and, and the surgeries that sometimes come when diabetes isn't well, um, you know, taken care of. Um, so it's important to know that because so much in the mental health and addiction space is like a, a one trick pony. It's just, oh, it's, it's rehab or it's just acute care. One of the things we've missed in mental health is ever paying for a continuum of services that include screening at stage one of these illnesses, like we do with cancer and like we do with, uh, uh, cardiovascular disease, all the prevention we put into the rest of our health care, we don't do in mental health and addiction. And we pay a huge price, not only in the suffering of Americans, but in the cost to businesses because of our policies not addressing this like, like our policies in health care address all other health conditions. Finally, the non-quantitative treatment limits uh, are really the, um, you know, medical necessity determination um, aspects, which are, you know, what's the use of pre-authorization? What's the use of retroactive review? What's the use of concurrent review? Now, these are all technical terms, but if you have ever had someone or if you've ever needed treatment for mental health, you know what I'm talking about. It's that you go in to get help or your family member does, and you find out from your insurance company that they're supposed to be out in two days when that would never be the case for another medical condition because of some onerous 
a medical necessity determination that says that that your condition in mental health isn't doesn't rise to the level of severity that requires the appropriate treatment which by the way the medical societies have deemed appropriate not the payers and david will get into that later on and with some of the case law around parity enforcement um yes but go ahead and uh, we'll we'll go into the rest of it later on thanks yeah, so, um, and, and Patrick, I think many people don't actually realize that this started, um, federal, uh, parity started with, uh, really with President Kennedy back in 1961. Um, so I, I thought maybe you could talk a little bit about, uh, you know, some of the highlights in kind of how the law has developed uh, through the Affordable Care Act. And then on the next slide, we have some even more recent developments. Yeah, so it is uh, remarkable that, you um, uh, President Kennedy really uh, pushed the first uh, parity provisions when he introduced the Community Mental Health Act. And in fact, it was the last bill that he signed before he was assassinated. And, uh, and those very same provisions of requiring equal coverage and treatment for mental health and addiction were part of a grander strategy that he had to get people who were caught in asylums in this country who had both intellectual disabilities and mental illnesses out and into the community supported in group homes and community settings as opposed to into big psychiatric hospitals and institutions. And of course, we all know the history of the last uh, 60 years that instead of building that community-based support, we have emptied out the psychiatric hospitals and most of the people have ended up in a new asylum called our jails and our prisons. Um, in addition to the outdoor asylums of our streets, and anyone who goes to any major city in America can tell uh, anyone else about the impact of our, our growing homeless population, which are clearly a reflection of not only the affordability of housing, but mostly the lack of accessibility to mental health services. Over the years, as you will see, uh, various iterations of parity uh, took shape, and uh, by the time it came around to the bill that Jim Ramstead, my Republican co-sponsor, and I introduced, our bill became the most comprehensive bill because it included not just what were considered severe mental illnesses like schizophrenia and schizoaffective and bipolar disorders, but it, um, other psychotic disorders, but it included all affective disorders covered in the Diagnostic Statistical Manual. And that meant addiction was finally covered as a mental illness, even though AMA said alcoholism was a disease back in the 50s. I mean, it took us this long to get our health insurance system to reimburse for illnesses of the brain in the same way that we reimburse for any other illness of the body. And on the, the next slide, um, there, were, uh, there were regulations in both 2013 and 2016 and then uh, just this past December, uh, new requirements were put uh, in place through the Consolidated Appropriations Act, um, which actually amended the Federal Parity Act um, to actually require uh, commercial health plans uh, that are subject to the Parity Act um, to really conduct detailed uh, compliance analyses on their non-quantitative treatment limitations, that is their managed care practices. Um, and the Department of Labor, U.S. Uh, Department of Labor, U.S. DOL, um, you know, has to collect at least 20 uh, plan analyses a year and whenever a complaint is filed. Um, and also importantly, um, plans uh, as of today, uh, you know, now have to provide state and federal regulators and plan enrollees, you know, these compliance analyses upon requests. So this was an important new provision that was put in place um, just this, uh, just in the past uh, year. Um, that I think has a, has important implications uh, in terms of port, Parity Act compliance and enforcement. Yes. In, uh, in addition forward. to that, in addition to that, David, as you know, the uh, federal courts have held that both the employer and the insurance company are both fiduciary fiduciarily responsible under the Federal Parity Act, which means parity enforcement can be levied against a plan sponsor as well as their third-party administrator, the insurance carrier that's administering their plan. So this is a very, very not, uh, it has, it's not well understood, but it, as case law develops, there's going to be a lot of um, 
heartburn, if you will, between the chambers of commerce and the American health insurance plans, because both of them are trying to shift the blame on the other. And there's going to have to be a lot of uh, uh, fighting it out, because at the end of the day, both of them are responsible. And, I, you know, that liability, frankly, is helping us push the coverage issue forward. But what's also doing it is the pulling it forward that groups like Moss Adams through their advisory work and others are doing basically by telling employers, listen, this is better for your total cost of um, of health care. If you want to reduce total cost of care, um, then including mental health reduces your cost to comorbidities of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, uh, cases like cancer, heart disease, all the rest improved tr tremendously when um, co-occurring mental illnesses are also treated. In, in other words, there is a strong financial incentive for both employers and payers to pursue expanded access to mental health. And But parity is kind of the, the stick at the end of the day. So between both, I think there's plenty of motivation for, for payers to do more. And obviously, uh, you know, the ones that they work for are the employers in this country, and they're certainly pressing their third party administrators to be more responsive to them by ensuring that there's more in network adequate coverage, which means, as you know, if there isn't enough therapists in network, then people have to buy access to therapy out of network, which is a parity violation because they'll have to pay more to go to a therapist for a psychiatric illness than they would if they had to easily go get a therapist for their child's asthma and pulmonary doctor or an oncologist for whom there may be a whole lot more of them. But, but plans and payers are reliable if they do not provide equal access to in-network coverage, which means in a timely way, and given the real shortage of mental health providers in this country, and it's getting worse and worse. We already had um, over 14,000 less psychiatrists in two years predicted. Uh, we also have 50,000 less psychologists. And COVID tripled the demand. So we were already 50,000 providers short on psychologists, 14,000 less on psychiatrists than were needed. This is pre-COVID. Now with COVID, the need's three times higher, which will show the enormous uh, gap there in access to care, which is a crisis in our country right now. Yeah. Um, and so several other updates that I just want to talk about very, very briefly. Um, so the U.S. Department of Labor actually cannot currently uh, issue uh, fines for parity violations. They don't have what's called civil monetary penalty authority. Um, and so there are provisions included in the House version of the Build Back Better Act um, which would actually provide uh, uh, the Department of Labor this authority, uh, which the Kennedy Forum has been pushing for and we think is, uh, you know, very important and was also a key recommendation uh, of the uh, President Trump's opioid commission, uh, Patrick, which you actually uh, sat on as a commissioner. Um, and, and then uh, just the other uh, kind of another update, uh, as we mentioned previously, there's some gaps uh, in the Federal Parity Act that we're trying to close uh, relating to um, you know, applying the Federal Parity Act to Medicare, uh, traditional fee-for-service, uh, you know, Medicaid, TRICARE, um, and then also student health plans that are self-funded are also not uh, covered by the, the Federal Parity Act. So all of those things are, you know, gaps that need to be closed. And so the Kennedy Forum, you know, is working with our advocacy partners uh, to, you know, close, uh, you know, close those gaps um, and, you know, have the, pi the Federal Parity Act apply more broadly to all types of uh, health coverage. So, Patrick, uh, you know, this is, uh, you've, you've highlighted some of the data already, but there is uh, an important report that was released a couple years ago um, called the Milliman, uh, by the uh, independent firm uh, Milliman. They looked at, uh, you know, coverage and uh, particularly out-of-network utilization. Do you want to talk very briefly about, uh, you know, what the findings of that report is? Uh, you were and you know what uh, why that indicates uh, that there's still a, a major problem yeah well not surprisingly as we all know mental health and addiction have been so stigmatized so uh, and because they're stigmatized they're um, they're really under reimbursed 
Uh, Sean can talk more about this after me. But the fact of the matter is because it's been so under reimbursed, um, fewer people go into it, which means, you know, right now when we need those people, they're not there. This is really highlighting the legacy of discrimination against people who are suffering from these illnesses. And uh, what the Millman did, report did is they analyzed, uh, I think, 36 million payers' claims data from across the country. And they analyzed the in network versus out of network access for various um, both physical, surgical, and mental health conditions. And what they found was not surprising, but but really stark. And, and that is, you know, in places like um, Delaware, inpatient uh, mental health substance use disorder treatment is 29 times more likely to be out of network than inpatient medical care for any medical condition. 29 times more like, which means it's going to be a whole lot more out of pocket to someone whose illness just happens to be an illness of the brain versus an illness of the body, uh, somewhere else in the body. And in um, Maine, that, that disparity was 38 times more likely to be out of network. Again, much higher burden on people with brain illnesses than if they had il other illnesses of the body. So um, this really highlights the challenge we have as a country right now. And we're going to have to do a lot of things policy-wise to try to um, make up for this huge deficit because it's unsustainable. And as I said, with the demand growing as a result of COVID, uh, these uh, disparities are going to get worse before they get better. Yeah. And, you know, luckily we do see uh, more state regulators uh, as well as the federal government kind of stepping up to the plate. Um, so here is just a list of recent uh, parity enforcement actions over the last several years. And you can see that um, you know, basically every major payer uh, you know, has been found in one way or another to, uh, you know, that there were parity issues. Um, the most recent one was with the New York State Attorney General and the uh, U.S. Department of Labor that took joint action um, and, and had a settlement with United Healthcare for uh, $18 million just in August. Um, so as you can see, there's, uh, you know, a, a lot of action, uh, an increasing action uh, at the state uh, and federal level. Yeah, you know, we started the Kennedy Forum on the 50th anniversary of President Kennedy's signing the Community Mental Health Act. And, and that act was uh, signed by him, uh, you know, only a few months after he gave a, the first president to ever address the nation on civil rights. And um, I really see medical parity for mental health and addiction as a medical version of civil rights because it's basically saying, we're no longer going to treat mental health conditions as separate and unequal conditions. Like right now, the House of Medicine threw mental health out of the House of Medicine. It's the original sin that's created the current crisis in this country. And to really bring us back, we have to reintegrate mental health into all of the rest of health care. So oncologists need to be trained on mental health. Because if they diagnose someone with cancer, they also better know about trauma and anxiety treatment and depression treatment. They can't just, you know, fob that off on a psychiatrist. They got to stand up. So our medical system has to change dramatically. Um, we need more psychiatrists, but we right now we need more of the existing medical professions to do more uh, in delivery of care, which... Frankly, they, they shouldn't be allowed to deliver if it isn't also including mental health because of the, how integral it is to the well-being of their patients. These lawsuits um, really show that uh, there's going to be less patience on the part of, of states. Politically, um, what this represents is like the civil rights movement where the NAACP identified certain places where they could get wins and create new common law standards – that's what's happening with these state actions. In other words, uh, some of these state actions have changed the way insurance companies cover, like, for example, medication-assisted treatment completely, all because of one state action. Um, one state action has the power to change the nation's approach, um, nationwide approach by certain payers. 
They figure if New York, if they've got to fix their standards for making medical necessity determinations in New York, they might as well do it for the whole country or vice versa in California or Massachusetts or Pennsylvania, as you can see. So, um, and in addition to that, many of these patterns of, of denial and, and uh, findings of discrimination against payers now are, are really uh, eligible in every state. So if you found that a certain payer has violated a parity in one state, chances are it may well be likely that they have done that same provision that has caused them to be in violation in, in the other state, in the, in the state that you're from. So you have a stake in, in, in what Illinois does, even if you may live in Florida or Arizona, you have a stake in what's going on in California or Rhode Island, or, because all of these states are contributing to the new common law standard. And every time one of those states stands up and says, we're not allowing these um, medical management practices to be used so onerously in denying treatment for people who need it, that becomes a signal and payers are changing their behavior simply by one state standing up. So I, I mean to say that all to you because um, you know, you should feel like all of you who want to see this, you know, process move forward. You have it within your power in your own state to really help us advocate for this movement. Okay. And so in the interest of time, I'm going to uh, move us right along. Um, but the two final issues that I wanted to just uh, touch on before we turn to the full panel, the first is telehealth. Um, and during, expand during the pandemic, there's obviously been an explosion in telehealth coverage and much of it was by necessity, but we've also seen policymakers uh, quickly reduce uh, you know, barriers to telehealth usage. Um, for Medicaid and Medicare, uh, the federal, uh, the Congressional CARES Act that was enacted allowed the HHS secretary to waive certain telehealth requirements during the public health emergency. Um, and last December, you know, Congress made permanent uh, you know, Medicare coverage for telehealth um, in the same Consolidated Appropriations Act. Um, and CMS actually just announced a final rule that made permanent uh, Medicare coverage of telehealth um, from patients' homes, which is very important, um, and also allows uh, audio-only uh, uh, reimbursement. Um, in the commercial sector, it gets much more complicated. Um, many states have acted for fully insured plans um, during the public health emergency, but haven't necessarily made those permanent. Uh, and on the ERISA, uh, you know, the self-funded ERISA plans, there actually are no rules on telehealth. Uh, that are in place because uh, um, uh, that is its own uh, very unique uh, market. Um, and so the second item I want to touch on just very briefly um, is an important class action lawsuit, uh, WIT versus United uh, Behavioral Health. And this was uh, uh, a federal class action case uh, in uh, Northern California um, in which uh, United was found to be using uh, you know, coverage practices and medical necessity criteria that were inconsistent with generally accepted standards for behavioral health care. Um, and so the court actually uh, ordered the reprocessing of 67,000 claims for the more than 50,000 class members nationwide, um, half of whom were children and adolescents, um, and also ordered the use of nonprofit uh, medical necessity criteria from uh, organizations like the American Society uh, of Addiction Medicine. And so as a result of that lawsuit, um, uh, the Kennedy Forum, along with many partners in California, led a, an important bill, uh, uh, Senate Bill 855, um, that actually uh, explicitly require plans to follow these generally accepted standards for all mental health and substance use disorders and to use um, criteria from these nonprofit uh, professional associations. Um, and that was enacted last year and became effective as of January 1st. Um, and off of that, uh, we created a model bill called the Ramstop model uh, that has been endorsed by many organizations and was also enacted in Illinois uh, and Oregon. Um, and so we think that this is an important, uh, important effort that really complements uh, the Federal Parity Act. So, Patrick, any kind of final word before we uh, uh, transition to the panel? Uh, on, yeah. on, on these issues? Yeah, yeah. So um, I love the input and uh, um, activity on the um, chat room. Um, I want to really clarify, physicians of all kinds are physicians and should be educated in how to treat the whole person. So uh, even though they have specialties, it doesn't preclude them from being able to meet any one of their patients' holistic needs. You don't have, 
have if you have a very severe case of a psychiatric disorder, then a psychiatrist is really the appropriate physician. But if you're my sister's oncologist and you've just diagnosed her as he did with lung cancer, giving her six months to live, and you have no training in how to help your patient deal with the trauma of that diagnosis, you're not doing your job is what I'm saying. So to the answer that oncologists shouldn't have to be providing mental health care, I agree with you. There are other professions that are more in tune with that, but all doctors, if you're a gynecologist providing women's health and you have no understanding of sexual trauma, you know, you shouldn't be a gynecologist. If you're an orthopedist and have no appreciation for how much alcoholism has contributed to broken bones, uh, or lacerations, uh, you know, you really have no business being an orthopedist because to treat your patient, you need to treat the whole patient. And unfortunately, in medical school, these issues were never taught. And what I'm saying is we need to teach all of our medical staff to do a better job so that we're not putting as much pressure, as I said, on the very small and very quickly dwindling uh, shortage of workforce because we're not going to be able to make, meet the need if, if all we're doing is relying on people with a, quote, specialty mental health um, definition. But I appreciate everything you've outlined, David. Um, th these are good points, and I look forward to yeah. hearing from the rest of the panel. Yeah, so hopefully that provides a bit of a baseline, uh, as it you know, can be complicated in the details. But I'm going to hand it back over to Brian Connor um, to help us with uh, one more polling question, and then we'll, we'll dive right into the panel. All right. Thanks, David. Let's get to uh, quickly our third polling question uh, here. Uh, and uh, uh, it's an easy one. Uh, we're uh, looking to identify where you based uh, in New England, Mid-Atlantic, Southeast, Midwest, Southwest, et cetera. Uh, go ahead and select the uh, radio button next to the answer that best fits uh, where you are based and make sure you press submit. Uh, as noted earlier, uh, by Mr. Kennedy, you know, regional parity enforcement actions. Uh, there's a link to uh, all of us, all different regions uh, have a stake in those. So it'd be interesting to see uh, how our audience uh, covers uh, our geographic representation in the United States. We'll give it just a few more moments here uh, to get uh, uh, the greatest majority of our attendees able to submit an answer uh, to qualify for CPE. Again, if you don't see the submit button on your screen, uh, scroll down a little bit. It might be hidden with the number of answers uh, that we have up here. So David, let's take a look at our geographic representation. I guess as expected, yeah, we've got a concentration in the West and the Pacific Northwest, but pretty good representation across the United States. Yeah, no, it's great to see uh, such a diverse uh, geography and among all the attendees. Um, so why don't we get started with the panel discussion? Uh, Sean, uh, Coughlin, I'm going to start with you. Um, obviously, the pandemic has affected everything, including the need for behavioral health services. We've seen a 30% increase in overdose deaths, um, increases in anxiety and depression, and increases in suicide among young people and people of color, um, and so on and so on. Um, what have your members been seeing uh, you know, during the pandemic and how have they been responding? And have these uh, you know, experiences differed based on kind of where they sit in the continuum of care? Thanks, David. Um, obviously, like everybody else, we've seen a evolving uh, impact from the uh, pandemic as things have changed over time. Uh, the immediate impact was, quite frankly, an almost uh, immediate shutdown of access to almost all of my member service lines. Um, you know, as we're talking about parity, one of the first orders of business that we found ourselves engaged in was trying to access PPEs for our uh, members. Um, again, you know, with all the services, um, all the service lines, we were kind of in the back row there um, trying to access PPEs. Very important for our membership because... As you know, a lot of our services are uh, group and individual uh, therapy based. Um, obviously, we've got inpatient services and residential services as well. Um, so we started immediately having to deal with um, access to PPEs. 
and finding ways to um, address social distancing, obviously. Um, groups of 15 or 20 people having to move to auditoriums or other uh, facilities uh, on campus if possible. Um, we were fortunate in working with the administration very quickly um, as they um, very, very quickly came out and designated uh, behavioral and SUD services as essential services. Um, so that was uh, very important out of the shoot. Um, that did uh, allow us access to some of the provider relief funds. Um, and we saw immediately uh, many members across the continuum starting to uh, engage in facility redesign um, and conversions uh, to again allow them to uh, start reopening their, their service lines. Um, obviously, we were subject to all the same uh, issues that uh, others were. Uh, staff, as we talked about, as Patrick mentioned, the workforce shortages that we faced to begin with were exacerbated um, as we had uh, clinicians who were out and quarantining or had lost access to child care um, as they shut down schools um, or were out taking care of families and spouse, et cetera. So um, that kind of was uh, slowed our, our ability to, to gear back up, but then uh, rapidly behind that came uh, the series of waivers that uh, were enacted, the most important of which being, I think, telehealth, which has already uh, been discussed. That really did uh, kick the doors open and allow us to start to uh, provide services again across the entire continuum, um, particularly uh, helpful in remote settings. I'm sure the Senator will talk a little bit about that as he comes on, but um, it definitely helped. There were a variety of other waivers uh, that uh, also helped in addressing the workforce shortage issues we're, we were facing, and that was um, really allowing providers to practice across state lines, um, allowing providers to frankly practice to the full extent of their license. Um, there's a lot of uh, conflicting state laws that limit the ability of, of a uh, licensed provider to provide certain services, particularly in the behavioral space. So. Um, those waivers really did expand the full scope of services that individuals are licensed and credentialed to to be able to provide. But again, because of quirks in, in many laws, um, are prohibited from providing that full scope of services. So that was very, very helpful. Um, obviously, we, we have seen the increase in demand. Um, we've unfortunately seen now children who are being boarded in emergency rooms, emergency departments, um, adults as well, obviously, across the across the uh, entire age spectrum, um, emphasizing the fact that uh, there is a need for more beds. As, as Patrick mentioned, the need for services and inpatient services never went away, could not be fully replaced with community-based only. Um, what we really need is the entire continuum of care. Individuals who have severe mental illnesses do and occasionally need uh, inpatient services, but um, you know, that's not a provision that can be handled at, at in the community alone. Uh, we need the entire continuum of care from inpatient all the way through community, and we need to focus on building that out. Um, as of now, obviously, we've got the vaccines now up and running. Um, we've been uh, seeing service lines reopening, uh, either in person or, or utilizing telehealth. I think uh, some of the figures we're seeing on telehealth utilization show that behavioral has been one of the biggest utilizers. Of, of telehealth services. So um, a lot of providers pivoting and building out those programs. Um, but now we find ourselves again forced with uh, having to deal with an additional uh, yeah. exacerbation of the workforce shortage problems um, because of this vaccine mandate. Um, depending yeah. on where you are around the country, obviously there's more hesitancy in some areas of the country than others. Um, obviously now we have just as of last Friday, we've got the administration uh, released both their OSHA um, vaccine mandate as well as the CMS um, mandate, which yeah. uh, obviously we're still digging through and trying to understand yeah. the full implications of, but uh, gotcha. um, that is, you know, yeah. requiring us to find novel ways to address and, and find new um, workforce, uh, you know, bring more yeah. people into to the workforce. It, yeah, it sounds like it's been obviously a very trying time over the last, you know, uh, 18 months. Um, so Senator Arch, uh, you know, we're going to uh, turn to you. You led um, a major new law in uh, Nebraska, uh, LB 487, uh, to increase access to services via telehealth to you know, help meet the challenges, uh, particularly you know, with the pandemic. Uh, so can you tell us about uh, this law and also you know, how has the, the uh, payer community responded? Sure, thank you. Thanks for the question. So 
So in Nebraska, it's probably just a little bit of a microcosm of, of what really the whole United States experienced, and it's even been mentioned already, and that was a, just a dynamic explosion in telehealth for behavioral health. And when I saw that, given my past experience in, in uh, behavioral health and hospital administration, I saw that there could be an opportunity here to understand in a unique situation. I don't think, <clears throat> I don't think it could have been scripted any any other way where where people were really being required to step into telehealth and and decide how best to use that. So what we saw as the rest of the United States saw that in the explosion of, of telehealth, approximately 50 <clears> percent, <throat> excuse me, approximately 50 percent of all telehealth visits were behavioral health. My understanding in talking to some of the payers now is that 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 percentage has remained about about the same. About 50% of all telehealth visits remain behavioral health. Uh, so, so what we did was we had an interim study to start with where we took a look at both utilization as well as which regulations do we want to continue after um, the, the pandemic. And so we did surveys. Um, obviously, we saw utilization exploding um, in, in telehealth. And then on the regulation side, uh, we got some very specific feedback of what were the most important. And we identified three of those. Now, I would tell you that Nebraska was probably one of the more open states to telehealth already. And I would attribute that to some of the rural areas where absolutely necessary that telehealth be provided. Um, um, some of the rural areas in Nebraska could require a half hour to an hour drive um, to get to a, 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 even a site where you would have a connection of network and, and the, ability to, the ability to provide a service there. So telehealth, um, absolutely necessary in the state of Nebraska. And on the regulation side, of course, Medicaid and Medicare um, governed by the Fed. So we really weren't taking a hard look at that. We were really looking at the commercial payers and which, which, of, these, which of these waivers we wanna continue. Almost all the commercial payers in the state um, immediately waived along with the feds, immediately waived a lot of things. So what we were really asking was, what do we wanna put into statute to keep and make sure that we don't go backwards when, when the pandemic ends and the waiver ends? And so we identified, in our particular case, we identified three that we wanted to put into statute. One was the use of audio only for behavioral health. And um, that, that was uh, obvious that that uh, there was a there was in those rural areas where you don't have broadband connection, the use of audio only for behavioral health was appropriate, and that that was accepted. Um, we also waived a written consent prior to a visit. One of the things, of course, that, that telehealth can provide that other face-to-face -face services find difficult is is that immediate uh, immediate intervention when there's a crisis. So we wanted to make sure that we didn't have this written consent required before you could actually see a new patient. So that was that was put into statute. And then probably the most significant was was the originating site. And and we put that into statute that now originating site can be anywhere. Anywhere that the patient the the the, the patient is located. So that means in state, out of state, in home, in a doctor's office, wherever it might be, that that the originating site uh, is acceptable as long as the provider believes that appropriate care can be provided by by uh, identifying that originating site. So that was the basis, and then 487, which you asked about, was payment parity for telehealth. Mm -hmm. So that um, that also passed, where where it requires that if if you are providing that same service, whether in person or telehealth for behavioral health, the payment parity uh, would, would apply. So commercial insurance is required to, to do that for all behavioral health telehealth services. So, you know, obviously the insurance companies weren't ecstatic about a mandate on, on payment parity for behavioral health, but I will tell you my two my two main points of rationale for why I supported it and why I introduced it were, were, was this. First of all, without payment parity, there is absolutely no incentive for telehealth when it comes to behavioral health. That's what I saw in the state of Nebraska. If you don't have payment parity and you have a workforce shortage already, the, the incentive to bring a patient into the office then becomes, becomes obvious. Um, I can fill my appointments without telehealth. Um, I can, I, uh, 
there is there is an unmet need everywhere in the state for behavioral health services and so it, i will always opt to bringing yep. that patient in well that yeah. automatically works out rural rural areas so that was one area and then the other was was i laid out the and established that the cost of behavioral health uh whether it be in person or telehealth was approximately the same so payment parity yep. passed uh, for behavioral health and was generally accepted by the by the commercial insurance uh, providers. Great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Senator. And uh, certainly seems like uh, Nebraska has taken some important uh, steps forward. So I'm going to actually turn back to um, Congressman Kennedy. Um, you, know, you said that uh, kind of our country's original sin on mental health was separating it from the rest of the House of Medicine. Um, and e but even prior to the pandemic, our system really couldn't meet the mental health needs of Americans. Um, and then, the, of course, the pandemic came along. Um, how has COVID changed the debate on mental health parity and in financing our health uh, healthcare system, uh, mental health care system more broadly? Well, you know, the, the idea of parity is not just kind of a legal f structure, but it's a concept of equality. Now, we all saw how quickly when our country needed to tackle the HIV AIDS crisis that we were spending 10 times as much money as we're tackling the opioid crisis, and yet we're losing three times as many people in the opioid crisis than we lost during the height of the AIDS crisis. It's just as a, as a matter of reference, and if you compare it to the amount of money we throw at cancer, it's not even a close call. During COVID, we, we you know, nation recognized a major public health need. It threw in behind it a huge way to get the vac vaccination. Thank God it did. And, you know, within a, a record amount of time, according to all uh, people who, who watch the way FDA works, and I mean, they said they couldn't believe how quickly because our nation depended on it. That's the kind of parity of urgency that we want to address the mental health crisis. Um, and, and, and so that's what we're really looking for. And it comes in so many ways. So the inadequacy, I saw a question about how the provider shortage is so acute in network. And what we're seeing in, in across the country is we're seeing um, insurance companies really ramp up their reimbursement. I, I, in Massachusetts, a great leader in, at Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, Andrew Dreyfus, um, you know, dramatically increased the reimbursement for child and adolescent mental health professionals because of the need was so great there that he wanted to make it a priority for that insurance company. Now. That's going to start to happen across the country, and, and, and payers will begin to adjust based upon the need. Uh, but as I said, if you really feel the need, you will find a way and in, in, in not be making up excuses why um, there's such a deficit in, in access to services. It is a violation of parity if you compare the adequacy of an in-network benefit for mental health with a, a network benefit for another condition, and there is huge disparities in the access to care between the two. That's a parity violation, and to remedy that parity violation, um, payers are going to have to take a number of steps. Telehealth is one. I thank you, uh, Senator Arch, for your good work. Uh, but but you know reimbursement ultimately is going to make a huge huge difference. Finally, say on the telehealth. We're really looking to see schools become site of service for telemental health for our school kids. I think all the stats that people have seen are that children's mental health crisis is just very, very acute. I have five children under the age of 13. I can tell you firsthand, this pandemic's impacted kids dramatically, my 13-year-old uh, quite significantly. You know, we need to provide support for our kids. You can't de delay this. Delaying this problem is going to make it worse. The better we do at meeting the needs of our children early, which will include under Medicaid um, designating schools as site of service uh, for delivery of mental health benefits, I think will be a big a go a long way to helping us meet this need. Uh, just think about the school nurse's office and how we could do telemental health for kids in school who who by never otherwise get a, a consult for a mental health professional because they live in, in a, in a na neighborhood where there's no access whatsoever. Um, so, so back to you, Dave. Great. Um, 
And Sean, I'm going to turn back to you. So Patrick, you know, talked about uh, you know some of the why the Parity Act is particularly so important, uh, you know, right now. Um, but you've actually been engaged in uh, you know a project with your members um, to really track uh, you know denials of uh, care and kind of what they're what they're seeing. Uh, can you tell us about the uh, portal that you've created and kind of what you hope to achieve uh, you know, by kind of tracking uh, coverage issues that you're seeing? Sure. Uh, obviously, we've been working with you, as you know, David, for a long time, the Don't Deny Me campaign. Um, interestingly, when we started this conversation, we asked people how much do they know about parity. Um, shocking, shocking that uh, there's so little. But the fact is that most people who are getting care don't know that they've been denied um, care based on a parity violation. So that's um, that's an issue we're trying to counter because our providers know it um, because they see it on, on with regularity. And you know we've started this process some some years back with our access to care board resolution, which identified many of the things that Patrick mentioned earlier. Obviously, that you know medical necessity determination should be made by publicly developed clinical uh, transparent. Um, or transparent clinicians um, and publicly available, not a black box that the insurer created themselves. Um, you know, that we need to address a lot of the utilization management techniques that he mentioned as well, pre-authorization, concurrent reviews, retrospective reviews. They approve care and then come back and say, okay, we're not going to allow, we're not going to pay for that at this point in time. Um, and then we've also touched on the issue of network adequacy. So we've known, and my, as my members have seen, that this is happening with regularity across the country. And we determined that uh, we really needed to, to get more granular. We've got a lot of anecdotal data that we've been talking about. But now, as we're seeing DOL with new uh, authority and new interest in really identifying what plans are doing, we decided to go ahead and create a portal where our members are actually submitting um, and trying to get more granular on that information to provide to, to uh, policymakers and, and um, oversight agencies. Who are the insurers? What types of mechanisms are they using? How often are they utilizing these, these mechanisms? Um, what criteria are they utilizing to deny claims? Mm -hmm. um, you know, the WIC case required United to actually utilize publicly available um, clinically developed criteria. Um, they continued to do so for two more years uh, before they even started to change that. So we know that they, there's got to be some attention paid to what they're doing, how they're doing it. Um, and also looking at what is the impact on our providers, our clinicians, and diverting them away from direct patient care to have to jump through these administrative burdens. So um, our hope is that uh, we'll be able to just really identify trends, identify payers. Um, we just had recently at our annual meeting had the um, – Acting Assistant Secretary of DOL, Ali Kawar there. Um, and this is exactly what um, he said they're looking for. They need to identify that their, their resources are limited. So um, we're hopeful that we'll be able to provide them real solid granular data on who's doing what, where, and uh, direct them at areas yeah. of look. Great. Um, so Senator Arch, I'm gonna go back to you and uh, you, uh, talk about uh, your telehealth again. Um, you talked about some of the you know, restrictions, both at the you know, and how the intersection of you know, federal rules and state rules, and you know, very complicated. Um, but one of the things that happened and, uh, with Medicaid in particular is that during the public health emergency, um, uh, CMS uh, you know, said it, it, it got rid of its requirement um, that said that a provider had, had to be located in the same state as, as the patient. Um, which really opened up uh, telehealth. But this really, um, uh, it touches on issues of interstate licensure, um, you know, telehealth, and kind of who should set, uh, you know, these rules, um, you know, for telehealth, whether it should be you know, the state governments or the federal government. Um, so can you talk a little bit about how policymakers should uh, you know, be navigating these complicating issues re uh, regarding, you know, interstate licensure and access uh, particularly given what I think everyone realizes is great uh, you know, promise of telehealth um, in the mental health space. Sure. Um, yeah. Well, I can tell you how Nebraska is is doing it mostly. I, I, sure. and, I and I would and I would put it in this category of compacts between states. So the Council of State Governments uh, has has uh, done a lot of work on compacts. Uh, Nebraska has joined a lot of those compacts, and 
the, and the requirement for licensure remains. You still have to be licensed in the state of Nebraska in order to treat a patient located in the state of Nebraska or a beneficiary from the state of Nebraska. So, so that, that doesn't change, but these compacts definitely facilitate and make it much easier. So, so there have been a number of compacts that the state of Nebraska has passed. Also this passed in, in the 21, 2021 session, we passed LB 390, which, which uh, facilitates getting a temporary license in Nebraska as well. Uh, I mean, all the ease of getting licensures, we've got a, we've got a bill in, in a committee right now for universal recognition of licensure. I think that I think that that movement is is accelerating. I obviously we're 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 getting into some some strong emotional feelings of of turf and and controlling licensure at the state level. But as as these compacts expand in particular, um, Medicaid in our in our state allows for that and some states do not. So the state of Nebraska has, has, has taken some, and, and I would say primarily because of the need. I mean, the need is obvious. We need providers being able to care for patients. And if there are providers in other states, we need to make it easy for that licensure to occur. No, I think that's absolutely correct. And uh, you know, one of the other you know, ways that we can you know, improve access is through uh, care integration. So uh, Congressman Kennedy, I'm gonna turn to you again. Uh, you've long championed integrating mental health and physical health, um, but most Americans receive their health care through their primary care physician, uh, yet few of those physicians uh, or clinicians are really adequately trained or you know, to screen uh, for or identify uh, and treat uh, common mental health and substance use disorders. Can you talk about trends in integrating you know, mental health into primary care? Yeah, so what there has been such historic discrimination just in general, as we've talked about, about this system being separate and unequal from mental health care. So it was obviously in the interest of all of us to get more um, IT connectivity with the electronic medical record, electronic health record. And, you know, the federal government subsidized that electronic medical, medical record to the tune of billions and billions of dollars through the meaningful use um, budgets that they put forward to build out that healthcare infrastructure. Mental health was never allowable under that. You, if you were a mental health clinician, you didn't get your um, data system, EMR, um, you didn't get your technology underwritten by the federal government subsidized like the rest of medicine. So that creates another barrier to true parity, because if you can't integrate and, and process the treatment through the normal processes of providing uh, health care in this country, you're really at a disadvantage. So integrating becomes a lot more difficult. And there are obviously many other barriers that exist that will, will make it more difficult for this care to be integrated. But increasing collaborative care codes is really one of the most effective ways so you could have that very short, you know, supply of psychiatrists consulting with other doctors on how they should proceed with their patients. We need to have that reimbursed as opposed to having them be reimbursed for seeing a patient. The better value for us with the psychiatric community is getting those trained psychiatrists to act as consultants and advisors to primary care physicians, to other uh, specialty care physicians who are able, with the advice and support of a psychiatrist, make determinations that are, uh, are appropriate for the treatment of their patient in an integrated way. Because we also know a lot of psychiatric illnesses are affected by the rest of the body. So having that medical perspective is so crucial. We know mental is, is you know, addressed with psychological kind of behavioral therapy, but in the brain, there are often medical conditions that uh, are necessary to be addressed, for example, psychopharmacology wise, as opposed to just thinking that a good therapist is going to make up for their psychiatric condition. All of these things need to be covered in the course of the treatment and, and integrated. Yeah. And there have been a number of states now, I'm, now that have actually uh, required uh, reimbursement for collaborative care codes. Um, and I know the most recent states, it's been you know, both the mental health advocates and the health plans, you know, supporting these uh, efforts. 
Um, so we're actually going to transition a little bit into talking about value-based uh, uh, payments. Um, so Sean, I'm going to turn to you again. Um, what are the benefits of moving away from kind of a traditional fee-for-service model? And for value-based payment models to work, um, what do you think you know, needs to happen? And are there pitfalls uh, that uh, we need to watch out for um, when pursuing value-based uh, value-based models? <clears throat> Well, it's a true double-edged sword, um, frankly. Um, you know, we would value moving to value-based, uh, value based, uh, pardon that. But, um, you know, and we know that the government, both Medicare and Medicaid, as well as commercial uh, payers, are looking at value-based paying for, um, you know, outcomes. And it's that's really heavily reliant on patient outcomes data. And per Patrick's point just a moment ago, um, Behavioral health providers were excluded, expressly excluded from accessing the high tech dollars that flowed out through uh, to hospitals and providers to actually develop the electronic health records, develop uh, medical, uh, you know, um, interact, inter excuse me, um, being able to share that information among providers, um, not only documenting what the needs are, there's obviously even with uh, substance use disorder treatment. Obviously, if a individual shows up at a facility and they are non-responsive, broken leg, whatever, um, and they don't have access to know that this individual has had an addiction to opioids, they are often prescribed opioids. Um, so that contributes to the problem. So really the biggest uh, issue there, I think, is first and foremost that the uh, need for these electronic health records and the data collection. The second is really also needing to define what standards and agreeing to what standards are we going to measure. And behavioral health providers have to be at that table. We're clearly behind the, the eight ball when it comes to what's happened on the med certit side of the equation as far as um, outcomes measurements. Um, but they absolutely have to be at the table. Um, they cannot just be provided by uh, the payers. And what we've seen in the past with the federal government, for example, is a lot of process um, issues, not true outcomes but just process. Did you do X? Did you do Y? Did somebody return? Was this chart documented? Was that updated? Those are all process issues that have absolutely no um, you know, value as far as what, did, what was the impact on the patient and where they improved outcomes. So it's a double-edged okay. sword, and we need to build out both sides of that before we move forward with it. Yeah, and certainly you need both payers and providers at the table. Um, and the Kennedy Forum participates in the, the Alliance for Addiction Payment Reform, uh, you know, which it has both at the table and is trying to work through many of these issues and develop the models. So uh, I'm going to turn things back over to Brian uh, for another series of quick uh, polling questions, and then we'll move to audience uh, Q&A. Perfect. Thanks, David. So we have a final three polling questions here for you. Uh, the first one is, what do you view as the most urgent, urgent facet of our mental health crisis? A, rise in overdose uh, deaths. B, youth mental health struggles. C, the long-term impact of trauma from COVID. D, homelessness. E, access. Or F, other. We've intentionally not included all of the above here to get some perspective on uh, the most urgent facets that you see out there. So again, select the, the radio button next to your uh, preferred answer and hit submit. If you don't see submit on your screen, scroll down a little bit and hopefully it will appear. We have two more polling questions after this. We'll do all these all right uh, back to back to knock these out before I turn it back to David uh, for some audience Q&A and, and closing. And give it just a few more moments to get as many attendees responding as we can. Let's take a look at our answer. So youth mental health struggles, obviously a huge issue. Right now we've alluded to earlier in, in the presentation, uh, but uh, as I suspected, uh, you know, pretty, uh, a pretty broad representation across these series of answers, uh, which I, I think is indicative of the, uh, this, the very serious issues we're facing uh, in the mental health arena. Uh, polling question number five, what is your greatest opportunity? Uh, what is our greatest opportunity in mental health care? A, integrating care, B, expanding the pool of providers, C, treatment innovations, 
D, prevention and screenings, E, parity, F, value-based payment, or G, other. And at the end of the presentation, uh, we will send, uh, or after the presentation, we'll send the CPH certificate uh, to you for your qualified uh, continuing education uh, with an email that will include uh, a link for the materials in this presentation as well as the uh, archive recording of the presentation. So keep an eye out for that uh, after the presentation. Well, let's take a look at our answers here. Again, a broad spectrum of answers. Uh, you know, lots of challenges uh, that we see uh, with mental health care, uh, but also, as, as seen here, lots of opportunities. Uh, and uh, uh, integrating care uh, seems to be the most popular uh, answer. Uh, big opportunity, also a big challenge. And let's go to our final question here. What are the biggest barriers to these opportunities? Is it political will, financing, scalability, lack of parity, rigid healthcare silos, or other? And you guys are, you, you, the audience is doing great today on getting these uh, quotes, questions answered as quickly as possible. I appreciate that very much. Select the button next to your answer and hit submit. We'll take a look at the results and uh, more importantly, turn it back to our distinguished panel uh, for audience Q&A and closing comments. All right, a few more moments, last stragglers. Get your answers in and let's take a look at the results. Now, David, looks like uh, rigid silos and, and financing and scalability uh, are uh, potentially the primary, uh, the biggest barriers uh, to the opportunities we saw in the previous question. But uh, again, lots of challenges, lots of opportunities, and potentially lots of barriers, uh, which makes uh, what we're talking about here today such a complex and complicated uh, series of issues. And with that, David, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, great. And I think these are you know, very interesting results. I can't say that they're entirely uh, surprising. So we're going to dive right into the audience uh, Q&A. Um, and we have a question um, from, uh, let's see, from, uh, from Andrew Coburn. He says, uh, provider uh, participation in payer networks is lower in behavioral versus med surge. Uh, this seems to be because payers continue to be reluctant to pay market clearing rates to convince providers to accept insurance. Um, will federal and or state parity enforcement eventually focus on network adequacy? And will payers be required to increase rates to bring in more providers and networks? So um, I guess I'll uh, uh, toss this over to Patrick and uh, perhaps Sean uh, to answer. Uh, Patrick, any thoughts? Um. No, I mean, I'm looking at the, the answers are the, to the questions are in the questions, obviously, in these terrific uh, surveys. I thank uh, Moss Adams for really outlining the, the breadth of the various aspects of our crisis and the number of things that we should be doing to address it. Uh, I would really say political will is the overarching thing, because if we had the right political will, we wouldn't be fighting an uphill battle on getting our kids the necessary resources. We wouldn't be, uh, you know, in stuck with such uh, anemic um, assets in the field to address this crisis. We wouldn't be arguing whether we should uh, make sure all of our fellow Americans are treated uh, in, in a way equal to the way they would be treated if they had any other illness. It's all around political will. And of course, because of the stigma of these illnesses, that is often yielded to be a tough uh, aspect because no one wants to put their hand up and say, they or their family members have been someone who's suffered from one of these illnesses. Until we change that, we're never going to get political leaders mm -hmm. to be responsible. We're never going to be able to raise money like other political interest groups to push mm -hmm. this cause and, and the many, many policies that we're going to need to, to advance all of these things. Um, the answers are there. 
and they're quite complex, but they are there. And But what we need to do is support efforts to put them in place. We don't need to know all the aspects of it. We just need to know that we're going to do it. And that aspect has not unfortunately been reflected in our political discussions. Yeah, and I'll just say briefly that I know the Department of Labor has indicated that reimbursement is a top issue that they're looking uh, at in terms of parity enforcement. And uh, the recent actions in New York State um, also had a reimbursement uh, a component. So I think we'll continue to see more, you know, more action uh, in this space. Um, so uh, next, uh, a question from Louisa Bonds. Um, she asked, and I think this is uh, specifically related to alternative uh, payment models, and Sean, perhaps you can take this. Um, so outside of process measures, uh, what specific uh, outcome measures uh, you know, might you suggest uh, for value-based uh, payment models? Is there anything that you might uh, turn to, uh, you know, Sean, in indicating you know, when we're achieving good outcomes? Well, that's, uh, that's one of the difficult areas because of the nature of behavioral illnesses. Uh, for an autistic child, for example, um, being able to tie his shoe might be a huge success for one. Um, completing a whole day at school uh, would be uh, success for another. Uh, so we have to be sensitive to um, the needs and, and the individual's abilities to reintegrate with society or to, um, you know, uh, just be able to uh, apply the, their daily activities and be able to, uh, you know, work through that to um, take care of themselves, et cetera. So, again, it's less about, how many times were they seen, um, et cetera, as much as what did it do to improve the quality of their life um, and their ability to take care of themselves, to integrate with their family, to reintegrate with society? Um, there's broader issues associated there. So um, there are some, unfortunately, we don't have the, okay, we've, we've brought our LDL down to an appropriate level or a test like that manner that we see on the med surge side equation. Um, so it is something that's going to have to be developed jointly with uh, payers and with providers. Um, what are those measures um, and how do we get to that? Um, there are some uh, measures, for example, in the substance use disorder uh, arena. How often does an individual, how long have they stayed in treatment? Um, how long have they um, you know, been active and, and remain in therapy? Um, there are other measures on the serious mental illness side and on, on depression, for example, um, on readmission rates, um, stuff like that. So there are measures, um, but they need to be jointly developed and, and well thought out. Um, we, we've also got a, a couple of questions relating uh, to telehealth. Um, I'll just briefly, uh, I won't read them directly, but just kind of summarize them. Um, one relates to the potential for um, you know, fraud in telehealth and particularly, uh, you know, audio only. Um, and the other relates to, um, you know, the cost of providing uh, behavioral health services versus in-person services, um, uh, you know, whether there was a differential in cost and, uh, you know, how that should affect uh, payment parity. So um, uh, if, I don't know if these came up in the discussion in Nebraska, but, but uh, Senator uh, Arch, was this uh, something that you confronted? Any concerns about um, you know, making sure that uh, you know, what's being built through telehealth is uh, is appropriate, um, and you know, also kind of the, the cost issue between kind of in-person services and you know, telehealth in terms of what it, it costs providers to provide those services? Sure. Thanks. Uh, when when we uh, when we started the discussion on audio only, we sat down with the Department of Health and Human Services from the state. And that was their very issue, and and so we worked through that. We worked we worked on the audio only as an established patient. There are also specific codes, so it's um, one of the things. And I would describe it like laying a, a phone in the room and doing group therapy. And and th it wasn't. There were certain codes that were just not acceptable for audio only. So we identified those, and 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 that's and that's been important on that. Uh, the written consent, we built in language into our statute that the insurance company is responsible when they go back in and, and, and audit um, the records that that needs to be in there within 10 days. And so um, we built some pieces in there because we recognize that that fraud could be an issue and, and we certainly don't want that. Um, yeah. With regards to cost, the, and, and you know, when I, when I started to assess the cost of a, of a 
a, what I would call a traditional med surge clinic visit compared to a behavioral health clinic visit. What I saw in our in our hospitals um, when in the clinics we traditionally had that three exam rooms, one nurse, a uh, perhaps a medical assistant to room the patients uh, doesn't exist for a behavioral health provider uh, that we that we operate. We've got nine child psychiatrists here at at, at Boys Town, and we have a room for the for the therapist, the psychiatrist, psychologist. We we have a patient or a family sitting across the desk in that room, and we don't have the nurse outside. We don't have we don't have all of the brick and mortar overhead. So, that was in in my mind that was really the justification for saying that the the um, the, the the equality of the of the cost for behavioral health, whether it be the patient sitting across the desk from the therapist or the patient sitting on the screen in front of the therapist, I, I found those equivalent and and that was my argument. Great, and uh, so uh, before we transition back over to uh, Brian for some final remarks, so Patrick, I'm gonna ask you one last question. We have uh, a question in the chat about quantitative measures and scores to measure and track mental health outcomes. And I know that you've been you know outspoken on the need for measurement based care. Uh, can you just talk in a minute, minute or two uh, you know about some some of what exists in terms of you know, measurement based care um, that unfortunately too often isn't uh, isn't actually utilized. Yeah, well, obviously we can begin by measuring whether the therapists are providing evidence based care, and unfortunately, in over half the cases in the country, according to uh, Tom Insel, former NIMH director therapists are not providing the evidence-based treatments for the conditions that they're treating, which is like astounding. Um, I've been in therapy a lot of my life and I can tell you even having access to best therapy did not guarantee me the best therapy because therapists still are not often trained uh, along the lines of cognitive behavioral therapy, which is the evidence form of treatment which has a wide array of different applications based upon different diagnoses. So we have to first train up, really, within our provider. That's differentiate the outcome. Yeah. Patrick, I think you're please breaking up for me a little bit. Um, so uh, why don't uh, we're going to transition back over uh, over to Brian. Um, and uh, first want to thank uh, all the panelists for joining us today, for sharing their expertise and passion uh, for mental health, and also uh, many thanks to Moss Adams for hosting this event. Um, and then finally, once again, uh, happy Veterans Day to all the veterans uh, who are joining us. Uh, so Brian, turning back over to you for some final remarks. Well, David, thank you so much. Appreciate uh Or where you are in the recovery path. So a um, lot of excitement out there on this. We just need the, the will to, to go ahead and reimburse for it and, and do it right. Well, thank you, right, Mr. Sorry. Kennedy, and, and the, the uh, uh, delayed remarks. And, and David, thanks for, for her moderating uh, this excellent panel. Thank you, uh, Patrick J. Kennedy, uh, John Arch, and Sean Coughlin again. Uh, you know, for your insight and thought-provoking discussion about transformation and, and payment reform and behavioral health and uh, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Nailed it. Uh, so, you know, we develop our, to close, we develop our conferences based on attendee feedback. Uh, because of this, we, we want to make sure we encourage you to complete our survey. Uh, it'll be uh, popping up here at the end. I think you'll have a link to it in the email you get subsequent to the presentation. To add a little extra incentive, we will be holding a drawing for those who take the time to complete the survey. We're giving away a 2022 uh, complimentary registration to next year's conference uh, valued at $850. So uh, to be eligible for that drawing, please uh, you know, complete the survey. It'll pop up uh, at the close of this webcast. We'd be uh, very interested in, in hearing from you. Uh, about your thoughts. Thanks again to our speakers, especially our engaged audience. We'll soon be on the discussion. I wanted to highlight a few of our resources uh, that are available to you uh, on our webcast console. Uh, we have provided you with several links, and please be sure to leverage these resources, including a download of a uh, PDF of today's presentation and a link to our Healthcare Industry Insights page. 
uh, with healthcare related content insights. Uh, and you can subscribe there to uh, customize Moss Adams content. Now, right, today's uh, virtual roundtable wraps up our 2021 Healthcare Executive Conference uh, series. Uh, we hope you enjoyed our three high uh, impact sessions uh, on transforming the healthcare landscape and that you can join us for uh, the live event, uh, fingers crossed, in person in 2022. So thanks again, everyone. We appreciate it. Uh, take care. And we'll talk to you soon.